Rubajan Hasmong. Development program in partnership with stakeholders from the public and private sector organized a development forum at the Paradise Seeds Hotel. The theme for this forum, HIV and AIDS related stigma and discrimination, is lined up to commemorate this year's World AIDS Day. Several officials, including the Director of National AIDS Secretariat, Usman Baji, dilated on the issue of HIV AIDS related stigma and discrimination. It, it doesn't happen in the Gambia. Unfortunately, it is happening. Because the statistics that I provided earlier are not from the matter, they are from the National Institute. It is a study called the Stigma Index Study, which I want to repeat. It showed that about 64% of people interviewed during that study, these are people living with HIV and AIDS, had experienced and acted stigma in their household or community at least once during their previous year. And they went for that to say 45 such a forum which is held quarterly is geared towards sensitization, information sharing and policy making on key development issues for the UNDP, the Gambia government and their respective development partners. Speakers such as Dr. Adam Asala and Dr. Lamin Sidibe gave detailed statements on issues relating to stigma and discrimination. To stigmatize actually is to mark out as bad to reproach and stigma is very closely linked to what we call in psychology stereotyping. Stereotyping in itself is resistant and it's a fixed perception and it is persistent also. Fear of stigma and discrimination can cause pregnant women to avoid voluntary counseling and testing which is the first step to reducing mother-to-child transmission. It may force mothers to expose babies to HIV infection because using alternative, alternative feeding methods other than breastfeeding, especially in the rural communities, may arouse suspicion of their HIV status. The forum was no one-way traffic in relation to information sharing on HIV AIDS and its challenges of stigma and discrimination. Therefore. Questions, views, and experiences were shared by participants as soon as the floor was open. Many studies that have um, documented empirical evidence of stigma and discrimination manifested um, in this country. So it is nothing new. And um, I think we need to move a step um, ahead. Uh, of course, um, our landed um, Dr. Carroll has talked about the Constitution. But I think in addition to that, we, we need um, HIV-specific laws that, that we need to enact to be able um, to um, protect people in different circumstances. We are facing a lot of problems, a lot of challenges. So we want people to change their attitude, not only in the family, but even in the health setting. We are having problems. If even um, stop others to go for their treatment, some people are not even going to health centers because of stigma, especially women. We are having complaints about some people saying that I am not going to this health center so and so because of somebody is there and if she sees me, she is going to talk about me. For Betty Jata, AIDS, despite being a deadly pandemic, is preventable and as such, Gambians, especially those who are sexually active, should go in for voluntary counseling and testing. Having thanked UNDP and their partners, she appealed for more sensitizations on stigma and discrimination since it is proven to be preventing many individuals from checking on their HIV status, thereby spreading the virus. Given that development in whatsoever forum should pay considerable interest to people's health, this UNDP development forum focusing on HIV AIDS related stigma and discrimination may serve a significant step in the fight against the pandemic. Modu Bajan, GRTS. Well, that report by Maudu Bajan takes us to our first break. We'll be back with good news from outside the Gambia. Stay tuned. Welcome back. 
As South Sudan edges towards the brink of civil war, there are new hopes for agreement of a ceasefire. Representatives from the government and rebel groups are set to meet in Ethiopia to end weeks of ethnic blockletting. CNN's Our Demon has been following events on the ground inside South Sudan and she files this report from the capital, Juba. The South Sudanese President Salva Kiir and his former Vice President and now rebel leader Reik Mashad have arrived in Ethiopia's capital with more individuals expected to be coming there throughout the day. Talks anticipated to begin possibly as soon as this evening or within the next few days. But these talks do not by any stretch of the imagination mean that there has been a cessation of violence on the ground here in South Sudan. The government declaring that state of emergency in two areas. The state of unity that is where much of the country's oil resources are located and also Jongolai state both of these areas are largely currently under rebel control but the United Nations is warning that even if a ceasefire is implemented that does not necessarily mean an end to this violence there has been killings and brutality grave human rights violations and atrocities committed we have seen evidence of apparent ethnic or targeting of South Sudanese citizens on ethnic grounds. This can lead to a perpetual cycle of violence that can destroy the fabric of the new nation. At stake is the very identity of this young nation. The UN saying that the country right now is at a crossroads. So far, this conflict has cost at least a thousand lives. 180,000 people internally displaced, and more than half of them have not made it to the safety of UN compounds. Grave concerns for their situation. It is believed that they are largely hiding out in the bush without access to food, clean water, or medical resources. Arwa Damon Siena, Juba. Vladimir Putin is vowing to tighten security across Russia ahead of the Winter Olympics. The Russian president was in Volgograd on Wednesday talking to survivors of the two terrorist attacks that left more than 30 people dead. Mr. Putin wants to reassure the world that his country is safe to host the Winter Olympics, which takes place in 36 days. Somber New Year's Day for Russian President Vladimir Putin, laying red roses on the site in Volgograd where a suicide bomber blew himself up on a trolley bus, one of two attacks in just 24 hours that killed 34 people. Then to the hospital to visit some of the 64 injured. The abomination of this crime, or crimes, that were committed here in Volgograd does not need any additional commentary. No matter what motivated the criminals' actions, there is no justification for committing crimes against civilians, especially against women and children. Putin is vowing complete annihilation of the terrorists and promising to beef up security across Russia. There's been no claim of responsibility yet. But suicide bombings are the hallmark of the Chechen terrorist dubbed Russia's Osama bin Laden, 49-year-old Doku Umarov. In March 2010, his female suicide bombers attacked the Moscow metro at rush hour, killing at least 40 people and injuring more than 100. Chechnya, once a war zone, has largely been pacified. But the terrorists have simply moved to neighboring Dagestan, 600 miles away from Sochi, where Russia will host the Winter Olympics in a little over a month. Clearly at the games, the, the, the opportunity to do an attack is going to be much, much tighter than, than any place else. So if they do an attack outside of Sochi, is it any less significant? Is that any less of a victory for the terrorists and less of a defeat for Putin? I would argue it's not. A worrying trend, young Russians radicalized by Islamic extremists. Russian media reporting that the suspect in the Volgograd train station bombing is a medic, Pavel Pichanin, who reportedly became a Muslim in 2012 and moved to Dagestan. His distraught parents followed him there, but he disappeared. <laughs> they record the video, his mother saying, Pavel, I'm appealing to you, please come home. We'll do anything, please come home. But Pavel answered in his own video posted on a terrorist website. I came here so that Allah would be pleased with me, so that I would deserve heaven, and you cannot deter me from this path.
Putin won the support of many Russians because he's been able to crack down on terrorism. These attacks could undermine support for him at home and shake international